Hello. Today we're going to look at the Kirchhoff Helmholtz Integral Theorem, <clears throat> and this is going to be part of our study on physical optics, part of the POT, physical optics techniques, lectures that we're putting online. <clears throat> And the point here is to mathematically formalize the concept of Huygens' principle. Huygens' principle is something that you learn possibly as a high school student, um, certainly as a college student in, in physics. <clears throat> and if you remember what Huygens' principle says, it says, let's say I have a source and it's emitting a wave. Huygens' principle says you can treat each of these points on a wave front as an individual source that you can propagate forward into the environment and it's equivalent to a wave propagating all the way from its actual source the electric currents that are oscillating back and forth generating these waves so this idea of taking a wave and extrapolating it forward we say you can do it but there are very few times we actually sit down in the undergraduate curriculum and sketch out exactly how you do that. The kirchhoff helmholtz Integral Theorem, which we'll just say is K-H-I-T for short, is a wonderful technique for doing that. So we'll derive that today. And this is part of the physical optics uh, unit, which is meant to supplement um, and complement what we learned in our geometrical optics unit. There's a point I would like to make here regarding that. Here I've got a, one of the um, students made a really nice set of graphics for their homework assignment involving some geometrical optics ray tracing. Here we've got the campus of Georgia Tech and we've got a receiver here a receiver here, a bunch of buildings, and a transmitter. So we have line of sight here, non-line of sight here, because this particular building corner is in the way. And uh, I won't name the student because I don't want to embarrass them, but they did a nice job and they really illustrated something important about the technique in their graphics. <coughs> so the student used a ray tracing uh, code and here you see an initial launch. This is a ray launching scheme where rays are being launched from the transmitter in all directions, sending out, striking the building where it will experience angle of incidence equal to angle of reflection. Um, second legs which are illustrated in the next slide. And the point that I want to make here is that what did we say was the boundary condition or the, <clears throat> the approximation condition for geometrical optics? Well, we said that in geometrical optics, we're going to break down our wave into an amplitude function and a phase function or the iconal. And we said the key approximation is that the uh, Laplacian of my electric field function, or my amplitude function, could be electric or magnetic, normalized against its amplitude and the wave number squared, that magnitude should be less, much less than the index of refraction, which of course in free space is one. So if this is much less than one, this is a good approximation to the solution. We got a lot of interesting results and we saw most of you had your typical multipath uh, delay profile where you had a leading component and then a bunch of radio echoes that tapered off. Uh, and that is sort of a classic channel impulse response or power delay profile in radio communications. Um, sort of a quasi exponential decay a lot of interesting variations in between, but generally that's how we model it. 
So you got to see firsthand what uh, channel impulse response of a wireless communication network looks like by doing this exercise. But if you look here, we said earlier that geometrical optics is the high frequency approximation of Maxwell's equations when f is really big. However, really, the key condition is this one, which says that electric field, or whatever field I'm modeling, vary slowly with respect to a wavelength. And we can kind of see that it does in the middle of the solution. Uh, if I have a transmitter, and I'm sending a bunch of waves, and they reflect off of a building, I have these fields where the solution, the amplitude part of the solution, is not going to change much in this region. However, all geometrical optic solutions that involve reflections create these shadow boundaries here. We call that a shadow boundary. So, where do we have problems with geometrical objects? Well, the one place where this condition doesn't hold. In fact, this condition isn't even finite, let alone close to one at the shadow boundary. Because as you move across, you go from a uniform or almost uniform field all of a sudden into nothing. It means there's a discontinuity in the derivatives and the Laplacian function here which means we can't use geometrical optics anywhere close to that part of space and expect to get the right answer or something even close to it. And so that's where we're going with the physical optics. Physical optics starts to introduce a little bit more wave behavior into our solutions and allows you to uh, smooth over those discontinuities in a way. So we start off with Green's theorem, and here's a really nice, elegant, three-dimensional uh, version of Green's theorem that we're going to prove really quick. So keep in mind, this is a purely mathematical function. So we have u, let's go back to black, no bulldog red on this slide, u as a function of x, y, and z. And then we have another scalar function, v as a function of x, y, and z. And recall, of course, that my del operator, I'll just write it here for posterity, the partial derivative with respect to x, stick it on the x, partial derivative with respect to y, stick it on the y, partial derivative with respect to z, and stick it on the z. Now, when we go over here, we have this relationship here. U times the gradient of V. So of course this is going to give you a switch to this is going to give you a vector. U is a scalar. You take the gradient of a scalar, you get a vector. Scalar times vector, of course, is going to result in a vector. And same with over here. This is a scalar. This is a vector. The operation of multiplying a scalar and a vector produces a vector. Ah, okay. So let's do a quick little relationship here. This says that if I integrate this quantity involving these two scalar functions across a closed surface S. So our closed surface S is going to look like this. We'll call S the surface here. And inside the surface is the volume V. Now, what this says is if I take this vector and dot it with uh, a differential normal element sliding around, picking up all the contributions on the closed surface, we recognize this is a flux integral. And if you remember back from your days Gauss's law says that these can be rewritten as the following. 
I can write it as a surface integral, or I can convert this to a volume integral within the surface if I take the divergence of the vector flux that I'm cal calculating as I slide around the surface and do that calculation. So if I take the divergence of this guy, remember divergence takes a vector quantity like this and turns it into a scalar. So this whole function in here should be a scalar function as a function of 3D space. And if we integrate it, we get something that's exactly the same as the surface integral up there. One of the first things you learn in vector calculus, Gauss's law, very powerful theorem. And <clears throat> what we can do here is distribute this divergence operator across these elements. So how do we do that? Well, we have to take the divergence of u times the gradient of v. And so this operates a lot like just the plain old chain rule in taking derivatives. We just have to modify things. First of all, I'm going to differentiate u and then multiply it by v. But because u is a um, scalar, the actual law in vector calculus is to take the gradient of u and dot it into v. So that's my first element. Then I take the divergence of this and multiply it by my scalar u plus u divergence of the gradient of v. Now I'm subtracting the same thing just reversed in operation. So let me just put minus and that's going to be the divergence, or excuse me, the gradient of v dotted into the gradient of u minus v times the divergence of the gradient of u. So that's the thing that I've got in my integral that I'm integrating over a volume. You see we can make some simplifications here. First of all, um, we know that the dot product of two vectors is commutative. So this is the, really the same as gradient u dotted into gradient v, which means these cancel, since I have a plus and a minus in there. And of course, this operator here, the divergence of the gradient of the scalar is really the Laplacian of a function, right? We write that as the following differential operator. It comes up in the natural sciences and mathematics so often we give it its own special shorthand notation, nabla squared or upside down triangle squared. And it's that partial differential operator. So we see here we've got our original form now. And that's our starting point for uh, the Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral theorem. Now, interestingly, we're also going to imply the condition that u and v solve the wave equation. They're Maxwellian in nature. And remember that the wave equation says that the Laplacian plus the wave number squared operating on u and v is equal to zero, which means, of course, that the Laplacian of u and the Laplacian of v can be easily written as uh, minus k squared u or minus k squared v. If we put go up here and plug that condition in, what we find is that 
this is really minus k squared uv and this is minus a minus k squared vu or they're basically the same so for Maxwellian fields this is equal to zero and this is what we're left with a result of Green's theorem applying Maxwellian conditions on the field So this says that if I have two fields that are Maxwellian, I take the field times the gradient of the second function, and the second function times the gradient of the first function, subtract them, and that flux should always be equal to zero when I integrate across the entire closed surface. So let's see where that leads us. So we have to pick a function that's Maxwellian. And the one we like to use that turns out to be one of the most useful formulas is this simple expression here. Voltage, or V, <laughs> as a function of x, y, and z, is equal to this complex exponential, uh, where this distance corresponds between to the distance between a point of observation and a variable of integration. A three-dimensional vector that slides around and allows us to uh, pick up all the contributions on the surface S. So this will be our, our uh, voltage function, or V function, it's not a voltage. It's actually gonna be a field quantity ultimately but we're doing it in the generic mathematic sense, and so we're using u and v as our functions. And to figure this out, we're actually going to, so this is actually the longhand version of this, right? This is a complex exponential function with phase progression away from r prime and the amplitude is going to attenuate much like field traveling waves one over distance here and you could plug this in and show that this solves um, the wave equation except for one point in space r equals r prime because that blows up the denominator so here's the situation we're going to pick a volume V and a surface that encloses it S. And we're going to construct that surface in such a way that we're going to put a point of observation uh, that's within a little bubble. So the way to think about this is in three dimensions we have a surface that encloses the volume we're going to take the tiniest little straw and send it down to a point here within that medium draw a circle around it and go back up so that basically a ball and a straw a tiny cylinder infinitesimally thin and then a little surface right here that encloses it that is also spherical and tiny vanishingly small. So if we do that, and we can basically short do as a shorthand notation, we're going to just write that distance as s, the distance from any point here to a point on the surface that will of course change as we slide around the integral and pick up all the contributions to the surface. So I still have an enclosing surface, and now I'm going to plug this into uh, the Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral theorem. So 
the first thing I do is note that I'm going to have two parts. There's actually three parts to this surface integral. Um, but I'm going to neglect one of them. So I've got the outer surface S here. And I'm going to write this as S integral over S. Then I can, on the other side, with this minus sign, I'm going to place all the other surface integral components from the discussion. Uh, that's going to be the ball and the straw, S prime. And the way that this is going to shake out, this is my V. And the amplitude that I want to solve for, the, uh, the field strength, complex field strength, complex field is right here at this point here. And that's going to be my function E. And I'm going to do this in a scalar sense so that I'm just going to leave this as a diamond subscript. We'll assign the polarization based on the, the source fields. And it's a phasor, of course, which is why it has a squiggle on it. So U is my desired field. V is a function that it helps me out that solves the wave equation. And then over here, <clears throat> I have the exact same thing, but we're just solving this across this straw and tiny sphere that encapsulates my point. And in fact, I really just have to worry about this ball that encapsulates my point. I'm going to make this little straw so thin that there's going to be zero surface area contribution. So really, S prime is just the area immediately around that point that I'm going to apply Green's theorem to. And so I have the exact same kernel. This is V. This is V. This is gradient of U. This is gradient of V here. This is U, my field strength that I'm solving for, or my field. It's not strength, it's amplitude and phase. So, all I have to do now is, um, let's take a look at the right-hand side first, because that's actually easier to deal with. What I'm going to do is integrate this over 4 pi steradians for that little ball. I'll give it a radius lowercase r. So I'm going to integrate that around 4 pi steradians. So I'm going to need to go from 0 to 2 pi in azimuth, from 0 to pi in elevation. Whenever I integrate across an area in spherical coordinates, need this element of integration, r squared sine theta. And I'm going to be doing an um, outward facing normal from the surface, which is actually inward. Because remember, this is a straw, so topologically, an outward facing surface normal actually points inward towards the center of that sphere. So I need to give that a direction too, so I put minus r hat, the unit vector that points always to the origin in this particular problem. So this whole thing is actually my dn that I'm dotting with this quantity here. And so now all I have to do is resolve this here. How do I take the divergence in spherical coordinates well, I can use this following formula. It's really just going to be exp to the minus jkr, distance away from the origin, times jkr plus 1 over r squared. And over here, I've got minus exp minus jkr over r. And I have to take the uh, divergence here excuse me, the gradient of the E field. 
and then I multiply that by r squared sine theta r. Now, this component is in the r hat direction. This component is going to be in some direction. We're not sure it's going to depend on the thing that we're solving for. However, conveniently, when I distribute this quantity out, I'm going to have this entire thing integrated over sine theta exp minus jkr. I have a net r plus 1, jkr plus 1 in this term over here. If I make r vanishingly small, this part goes away, and I'm just left with the E field. If I make r vanishingly small over here, then all the components that depend on the gradient of E field also go away. And the only thing I'm left with is my E field times 1 times the rest of this quantity. So, all I have to do then is integrate from 0 to 2 pi with respect to phi and from 0 to pi with respect to theta of the quantity of whatever field that is at that point times the sine of theta times exp minus jkr which of course if r is vanishingly small this is also one so really all I'm doing is integrating over 4 pi steer radians a quantity that should be roughly constant right there at that location which means this is my final result all that effort just to get a nice simple result and so here is actually the form of the kirchhoff helmholtz integral equation if i plug this back into here i can show setting it equal to the left hand side this is the Kirchhoff Helmholtz integral theorem and notice we've just made a slight change instead of s I'm reintroducing the distance between my point of observation my POO and my variable integration r prime which is what I integrate over the VOI the POO and the VOI always good to keep them separate in electromagnetics because in three dimensions it gets hairy very quickly so here's my field here evaluated at the variable of integration here's the divergence of my field very uh, evaluated at the variable of integration thus if I know what my fields are all along here then I can make R any point within this bounded volume and calculate the fields exactly using this expression and of course we know that based on the uniqueness theorem as long as we have a smidgen of loss or we exclude goofy resonant solutions just out of hand that that solution is going to be the unique solution for the electromagnetic field and so this is a very powerful integral formula and it's not really an integral equation in the sense that you solve in numerical electromagnetic techniques because what we're saying is we know this the uh, fields here. We can turn it into an uh, integral equation if we wanted to and treat this as an unknown and apply some other conditions to try to solve it. 
But this is a great formula for extrapolating field behavior into an unknown region. So what we'll do next in our next lecture <clears throat> is take a look at what happens um, on surfaces, planar surfaces in particular, and apply a special set of boundary conditions that us allow us to use the KHIT, kirchhoff helmholtz integral theorem, and uh, construct solutions in half spaces. So see you then.